a central theme when I when I think about your work and your research, for me, is this idea of hormesis and the survival signals we put on the body. And I wonder if at the start of this conversation, you could outline what hormesis is and why it's so important when we come to think about aging. Well, the, the problem is we've built a world that's that's very comfortable. And we were not, we did not evolve in these conditions. We are meant to be typically uh, cold and hungry. And in response to those adversities, our bodies fight back. And so what the, pro the problem is that we now sit in chairs, we eat as much food as we want, we don't have to walk anywhere or lift anything heavy, and our bodies become complacent. Now, what was discovered is you need hormesis. What's that? That basically means the what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Um, and so what we do when we exercise and what, if we skip a meal, what we're doing is inducing this very ancient, very, very ancient, billions of years ancient mechanism that protects our body against decay, disease, uh, and the root causes of aging in an effort to survive. Uh, and so you really want to do the opposite of what modern life gives you. Yeah. One of the things that you recommend, I guess one of the most easy to understand and simplest interventions you recommend for people is to eat less. And I think that fits quite beautifully into this uh, idea of hormesis, doesn't it, in terms of what eating less signals to the body and then what it causes the body to do afterwards. So I wonder if we could just sort of dive in there into why is eating less important? What signal does it give us? And then how does that impact the way in which we age? Well, there are, there are three main longevity mechanisms that we know of. Um, they have certain names. One's called sirtuins. There's seven of those genes in our body, and we've been working on them for 25 years. Another one's called mTOR. The other one's called AMPK. The names don't matter as much as the fact that they're activated by, by a bit of hunger. Um, to give you an example, in 2005, we, we published a science paper that showed, uh, which at the time was revolutionary. Now it's just considered obvious, but one of these sirtuin genes called SIRT1 was activated by caloric restrictions. So we found that animals that had been eating less and had low levels in, of insulin and another factor that's related called IGF-1 insulin, related growth factor, uh, that boosted the levels dramatically of this SIRT1 protective longevity gene. Uh, and then we showed that protects against DNA damage. Uh, and so what we do when we're hungry uh, skip a meal or two, which is what I do every day, uh, it boosts up our longevity genes and they take care of us. Uh, we know that if we boost the longevity genes in animals, they live longer, they're healthier, they stay fitter for longer and they die much quicker at the end of life. And you know, I think everybody would know that in, in human history, fasting is considered one of the healthiest things you can do. Um, and so there's so much evidence that it's really incontrovertible that skipping meals is not only good for you, but will make you live longer. There's many ways, of course, to skip meals. Uh, you know, how do you view fasting? Because there's, you know, all different types of intermittent fasting uh, protocols out there. Uh, there is time restricted eating, which I know. Uh, Sachin Panda has done a lot of the research on at the Salk Institute. And, you know, I think it's quite a confusing area for people coming to it fresh, specifically through your lens of looking at longevity and how to delay or even prevent aging, or, well, we'll come to it later, even reverse aging. You know, how do you look at foods um, and how we can practically, you know, do this in our own lives? Yeah. Well, there was an incredible study that um, was that of the NIH uh, in Bethesda. A good friend of mine, Rafael de Cabo, and his lab had over 10,000 mice. They put them on different diets, different carbs, protein, fat. And they, they then divided those diets into two groups. Some mice got food all the time, and they nibbled on it during the day. And then the others got the meal once. I think it was for an hour only. And those mice gorged themselves and, and ate almost as much as the ones that were grazing. 
And it didn't matter what the food was. It was the ones that ate in that window that lived dramatically longer. So if you can extrapolate, and there's always caveats, but I think the principle still holds in ourselves, which is it's not as much about what you're eating, but when you're eating. And it is confusing because, first of all, we're all different. We have different levels of willpower. We have different jobs. Some of us are hungry in the morning. Some are hungry at night. Um, some of us can go for three days. I can't, but some people can. Some can go for just a, you know, the morning. Plus, we're all genetically different. We all have different microbiomes and food preferences. So it is complicated, but I, I found it relatively simple to explain it this way. If you are not starving at breakfast and you prefer dinner, skip breakfast. And if you can do without dinner, skip dinner. But skip one of those two because then you have a whole period of sleep that uh, means you're fasting and your body will protect itself and repair itself better. Now, you can take it one step further if you're game. Uh, and that's what I did over the last um, 18 months during the pandemic, was to also, as best I can, skip lunch as well. So I go all day without eating with a tiny little bit of yogurt in the morning to dissolve a supplement. But essentially, I'm just uh, here, I'm holding a glass of water. I'll have tea, I'll have coffee, that'll keep me full. Um, and I go till dinner. And at dinner, I have a reasonable meal. I'll go out to a restaurant and I'll eat something and try not to be full. I don't stuff myself because I'll actually sleep poorly. Um, but I, I really enjoy that. And first of all, it saves money. Second of all, it makes you enjoy food a lot more. And third, there's a misconception that you'll feel tired. It's totally wrong. If you can get through three to four weeks of that with some willpower and, uh, and a bit of uh, hot beverage, a few hot beverages, you'll actually get your body will get accustomed to it to the point where eating lunch feels weird and you definitely don't need it and you definitely don't feel tired. And I don't get that afternoon slump, which I know is caused by uh, a, a decrease in insulin after a lunchtime meal. And I've never felt better. I've never looked better. I've never had so much energy physically and mentally. It's fascinating when we think about this through an evolutionary lens that you know, of course, why why would we be struggling mentally when we were hungry? Because, of course, if we really were hungry in the past, we would need our uh, you know our mental acuity right as as good as it could be to go and actually fix that problem, get out there, find some food, hunt. So it, it really makes sense. But it also it also makes me think of what you said right at the start of our conversation about modern life being too comfortable because. You know, I'm in my early 40s. I remember from a young age, you know, even though I'm from an Indian family, I saw my mum practice various forms of fasting once or twice a week. But we never did. You know, for us, it was get up as soon as you're up, eat your breakfast, you know, eat, eat, eat was the message I got as a kid. And I think that's the message a lot of society gets. So when you talk about eating less or reducing how often you eat could potentially give you short-term health benefits, but also long-term health benefits and delay aging. I think it's quite revolutionary for a lot of people to hear these days. Well, intermittent fasting now is the most popular diet in the world. And it, uh, it, hopefully it's not a fad because this is probably the most effective diet that's ever been promoted in, on the planet. Um, even for children, I'm not suggesting malnutrition or starvation by any means, but having three meals a day plus snacks uh, is a calorie overload for even for children in the most case. And you can tell just by the amount of fat a kid is carrying as to whether you're overfeeding your kid. And if you're if you have an obese child, and I know it's very difficult because in my family we struggle with this as well, but the effects on that child will echo for decades, perhaps even towards the end of life. They will still have the memory, the epigenetic memory, we call it, of having been obese as a child. And so one area that I'm researching and going to be communicating about is the effects of our lifestyle, not just on adults and the elderly, but even on children. Yeah. I want to come back to that shortly. Um before we leave the topic of eating less, 
You said intermittent fasting is the most popular diet or way of eating in the world now. And, you know, there's brand new blog posts, podcasts, YouTube videos every day coming out on this. Um, do you think of intermittent fasting as different to time-restricted eating? And the reason I'm sort of diving in here is, you know, when I see patients, I have to be very clear with what I'm asking them to do, you know, very specific so they really understand what I'm recommending. And I think for some people, intermittent fasting is one meal a day. For some people, it's you know, 16 hours without eating and eight hours a day where I'm consuming food. Then you also have time restricted eating where it's eat all your food within an eight hour window or a 10 hour window or a 12 hour window. And I think there is a little bit of confusion out there as to what these terms actually mean. So how do you put that together for people uh, if they're asking? Oh, I, I, I don't think that it's helpful to have these all these different names. It's essentially just eat less often. That's how simple it is. Skip a meal, skip the snacks. Um, so intermittent fasting, time-restricted feeding, uh, to me, it's all the same thing. It's just uh, go and keep your body filled with food. That's pretty simple. Um, the amount of hours, the more you can spread it out. So 18 for me is is a good good number. Um, 16 is okay. Um, you know, I, I eat within two hours, so I, I get basically 22 hours, which works for me. Uh, but here's the, the, the really important point. Um, it's not complicated. You do what you can. You start skipping meals. Start with one, dinner or breakfast. And then if you can do that, then try to go longer. Um, it's not, the, the other really important thing is if you try to do what I do from a standing start, you will fail. There's no question. It's too hard, your body will freak out, it'll feel tired, your brain will be distracted, uh, and you'll go straight to the fridge. You need to give yourself time. It can take a month to get there. And one of the adaptations is your liver needs to learn to put out glucose to maintain steady levels so it's not like this through the day. And, and that takes, takes a while. Uh, but once you're at the state that I'm in and your microbiome is optimized and your liver is very happy with its existence, then you, you will find it very hard to go back to eating the old way. Um, and you also generally look a lot better as well, which is a nice side effect. If you enjoyed that clip, here's another powerful clip that I think you are really going to enjoy. Walking a lot materially affects the volume of the hippocampal formation. It gets bigger as the result of exercise and the functions it supports get better in a very important sense you've reversed the functional aging of the brain